today is Tuesday. It's the 5th of June. We are here for microeconomics as kind of a review session in B12. We are talking about substitutes in production. We've taken appendix B, question number one, put it on the board, and then reminded ourselves about the rule about substitutes in production. And then we went through the logic of it all. I like to do it for a farmer, okay? If I'm growing, I've got 160 acres, I can grow so soybeans or I can grow corn. Which one do I want to grow? The one that makes me the most money. I'm an American, okay? So, if the price of soybeans goes really high, I'm going to put all my, my land into soybeans, that's going to reduce the supply of corn. So if you, it helps you to remember the logic, do that. If it helps you simply to remember the rule, the arrows go in opposite directions. Yes, sir? Uh, I'm just going to change the recording key so you get that single file today. Oh, okay. So go ahead and continue. Okay. So, are we okay so far, everybody? Okay. So then we need to draw this out, and we're going to be talking about good A. Yes, sir. I don't know. Okay. We're talking about good A, and we're saying that um, at the initial equilibrium, supply and demand, equilibrium, there is a price floor. Price floor. And now we say, how is the price floor going to have an impact on this behavior? And since we know the supply of A, as a result of all of this, supply of A is going to decrease. We don't use up or down. We say decrease. Which way does the supply curve move? Decrease is always to the left. So I say, okay, if the supply curve shifts to the left, S prime, new supply curve, equilibrium is going up here from point A up here to point B. Is that permitted given a price floor? Yeah. And the answer is yes. So in this case, since the price goes above the price floor, the price floor is irrelevant. It's just thrown out there to try to trip you up. And so somewhere in an answer then I want to be able to describe this phenomenon. The price will decrease, the quantity, I'm sorry, the price will increase, the quantity will decrease or they will achieve a new equilibrium, or I'm not sure how the correct answer was worded. Supply of A will decrease raising the price. It sounds perfect. Good. It's also worthwhile on these questions to look at the three wrong answers and understand why they're wrong. And, and having said that, let me remind you of one other thing. When you're going through the practice quizzes, or even the markets review quizzes, if you find yourself simply looking for a right answer, you're in deep trouble. Because if you start looking at a question and say, oh, I remember that when the answer is this, because you saw the question on a quiz or two before, uh, looking for the right answer won't do you any good on an exam. Okay, Memorizing that this answer goes with that question won't do you any good, because you're not going to see the same questions. You've got to go through the logic. Same question twice on a lot of them. I mean, a lot of the same question would come up in the same review quiz. In the same quiz? Yes. But it asks, is, the answer is different. It, it asks... Well, yeah, one, one would ask for, like, right. supply, and one may ask for yeah. demand, but, like, even even the supply, like, question would come up twice for the same... The same identical same question. same identical question. I'll take a look at that. It shouldn't be happening. Okay. So with this one, yeah. initially, I thought the answer was there would be a surplus of good A. That's what I thought at first too, and then I went back and read like what I, whatever he explains the answers, yeah. and then it explained it. Let me show you like, that. Okay, so that's why this is like this. When we when we have a price floor here, and for some reason the market tries to set an equilibrium below that, right? can't go below the floor. Floor is a minimum price. So then we say, since we can't get down to this price, let's measure what's going on at this price, because this is the price we're stuck at. And to do that, I'm going to take this out now for a minute, we've got to read over first to the demand curve and read down. This is how many people are trying to buy at that relatively high price, maybe 15 units. Then we read at that price what's going on in the supply curve and read down. This is the quantity supplied. Sellers are offering 70 units for sale. There's our surplus. The surplus is 
55 units. So in the other, in the, the ads, the right answer, there's, there's nothing to stop the market doing what it's doing. There. Exactly. You can go above the floor. It doesn't, it doesn't have any effect at all on your issue. Okay? Good. Okay, watch your uh, video after class or whenever you have a chance and let me know what you think. Okay. Uh, if you don't like it, let me know. If you do, great. Um, um, you can also let me know. Tell me your name. Troy. Troy. Yeah. Uh, uh, you can... I'll email you when I get to my office and I, I start doing this stuff. Okay. But I, it's off campus, so I need maybe a, an email address for you. Yeah. And I'll be delighted to do that. All right, another question. Okay, 17 in Appendix B. Appendix B, number 17. And I think this is on Appendix A as well. An increase in the price of milk is followed by a fall in incomes. Okay, the price of milk goes up and incomes fall, okay? If cereal is a normal good, Cereal is normal. What would be the effect on the cereal market? So what happens to the cereal market? Thank you, Troy. I appreciate yeah, that. I appreciate everything. That's fair. You have a good one. You too. All right. What does milk have to do with cereal? They are complements. You buy one, you buy the other. Most of us. Well, he's out of a student in class somewhere will say, well, I don't like milk on my shelf. I don't give a damn, okay? This ain't about you. It's about the market, right? So what's the rule for compliments? When the price of one good, let's let that be milk, goes up, what does that do to the other good cereal? Given that they are compliments, which curve is affected? The demand curve, okay? Complements has to do with the effect of the price of one good on the demand for another. What's going to happen? If milk gets expensive, I can't afford the milk, so I don't need the cereal. So we say the demand for cereal is going to decrease. So that's one of the things that's going on in this, in this example. The second thing going on is that incomes are going to fall and cereal is a normal good. So what curve is affected by any change in incomes? The demand. the demand curve also. And if it's a normal good and incomes fall, what happens to the demand? It also decreases or moves to the left. So in this question, we have the, the same effect on the demand curve. So there's only one thing going to be going on here. That's a decrease in demand from wherever it was to its new level. Everybody okay with that? So the price is going to be lower and the quantity is going to be less. Questions on that so far? I'm going to play with this for a minute here. So far, everybody okay? And the quantity supplied as well is also less. Yeah, your answer could say there will be a decrease in quantity supply. Movement along the supply curve to a smaller quantity, yes, that would be a correct One of the things I found as I go through the questions, it's helpful for me to label each part, what effect it has on demand, what effect it has on supply, and then the quantity supply. And the quantity Absolutely. Demand. That way there's no confusion when you get down to the answer of what your sure. result would be. Yeah, you have got to be able to remember that when you go from point A to point B on that supply curve, that is not just a shift or a decrease in demand, that is a decrease in the quantity supplied. So, and that could be the way the, the answer is phrased. Okay, so far. What if I change the question? What if I said incomes rose? So we have a brand new question just by changing one word. Incomes rise. How would that change your answer? Incomes rise means that the demand would increase. So on our graph, 
instead of a decrease in demand, this one would give us an increase in demand, but this one gave us a decrease in demand. So we say, gee, that's pushing the demand curve in both directions. So what do we conclude? It's ambiguous. Everything's ambiguous. The price might rise or fall or stay the same. The quantity might increase or decrease or stay the same. Can't, I don't know. Total ambiguity. Okay? And many questions don't lead you to that total ambiguity. But if you have one curve and just one curve trying to move in both directions, you know, that's kind of a tricky question compared to the norm. Okay? Next question. So will supply always angle up and to the right yes. and demand always to the bottom? Always. Right. Think about it this way if it helps. The demand curve has what we call an inverse relationship. Shows a, an inverse relationship between price and quantity demanded. We call that the law of demand. And the law of demand is nothing more than a statement of what is generally common sense. When stuff's cheaper, we buy more of it. When we get ready to go into the material for the second test, we'll be talking about how steep or shallow is the slope. But for right now, it's always a negative slope. That's all we need to worry about. Imagine this. A researcher goes out and he says, gee, I noticed when the price of cars was $22,000, that year they sold 1 million cars. The next year when I saw the price went up to $26,000, they sold two million cars. Wow, that must be a positively sloped demand curve, is it? What's really going on here? Well, this is nine, nine, this is 2017. This is 2018. What really happened? It shifted. What shifted? The demand curve. Yes, these are two points perhaps on the supply curve, which you got from one equilibrium that year to this equilibrium the next year because there was a change in demand. And that's, that's something fairly, you know, it, it crops up once in a while in undergraduate research. Yes. They simply identify something wrong. Right? What does the phrase, Cateris paribus, mean? That's how you pronounce it, Ketteris. Huh? And then I used to pronounce it Ketteris. Yeah, I understand Ketteris. that in Latin Ketteris. there is no soft C. Ketteris. I was told that there is no soft C in Latin. I believe you. I believe you more than that. Hell, I don't know. I just work here. I've been living my life all along. Yeah. <laughs> what does it mean? <laughs> if everything else stays the same, here's the demand for milk. Okay? Now, the first time incomes change, the demand curve is going to be diff a different one. Or the first time this changes that. So we make this assumption, Cateris Paribus or CP, because if we hold everything else still, we can analyze this. How much good is that in the real world? Things are changing all the time. And so we have to recognize that when we study microeconomic theory, what we call neoclassical microeconomics, it's very artificial. This is generally going to be true. But it's not always going to be there. It may be out here. It may be in here. And when you don't really know where the damn thing's going next year, you're really kind of guessing when you decide about policies. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. Okay? We want to keep that in mind. At some point in the course, I'm going to start beating you over the head and shoulders about the fact that everything I've taught you is a lie. You see, we spent 200 years developing these theories and these models. And students take this course and go out and think, I understand how the world works. But, but this is the Cateris Paribus world. That's not. Cateris Paribus, all things constant, ain't. And so to, it's, it, it's becoming of growing importance to recognize that the models we create in here, which help us understand do not explain in detail and with certainty what's going to happen. They're just approximations. 
So when you hear people out there in the media, politicians in particular, who talk about free markets are the best thing in the world, free markets always give you these, these perfect equilibriums, free markets work this way and they're great, they're still thinking about a theory that doesn't always translate into reality. And, you know, we, we haven't taught this course that way for 200 years. But we're finally beginning to recognize that this has some limitations. This isn't revealed wisdom and truth. This is an approximation of what we see going on out there. Now we'll get back to that. Next question. C? Sure. Uh, this is number five in appendix C. C is in Charlie? Yeah. Number five, okay. A price floor uh -huh. on good R okay. is imposed at the current equilibrium price. Okay. Subsequently, incomes rise. Okay. R is inferior. Okay. And then at the same time that a tax is imposed on sellers of R. on the sellers. We'll always put tax on sellers for this course. We can put taxes on the buyer and, sh and affect the demand curve, but we just limit ourselves to the sellers for right now. So everybody clear on what's going on here, right? We're going to look at good R. And I see a couple of things going on here, a change in incomes and a tax. When we put a tax on sellers, which curve is affected? When you put a tax on a seller, that's just like adding another cost of production to him. The tax will decrease the supply curve. So we see this effect on the supply curve, and we see this effect incomes on the demand curve. So if both curves are going to move, I'm going to want to draw two graphs. So let's start off the graph the way they tell us with a price floor at equilibrium. Let's do the same thing over here. This is our initial equilibrium. And let's see what's going to happen. In the, in the instance with incomes, an increase in incomes and an inferior good, what happens? As the incomes rise, we buy less of the inferior goods. Think ramen noodles or... Uh, how many of y'all have tried Spam, the food product? <laughs> tried it. You've tried it. Did you try it hot or cold? Straight out of the game. That's pretty brave. Next time, put it in the refrigerator for a couple hours. Then, then open that can of Spam up and throw it out on the plate and watch it jiggle. Because it's got gelatin around it, surrounding it. And then cut you a, a slice off about that thick and eat that. Tell me how you like it. Yeah, your face says it all. <laughs> Sounds pretty disgusting. Anybody here like Spam? <laughs> Spam's a treat in Hawaii, you know. They consider it a, a, an hors d'oeuvre, a very popular hors d'oeuvre. And I'm telling you, if you take sliced Spam and fry it up, you can use it and make a BLT out of it. Use it instead of bacon. It's very it's so salty. Bad it's for really you. good. Huh? It's so bad for you. What do you look at this body? Come on. <laughs> I'm 92 years old and I look like I'm 30. Okay? Spam's good for you. <laughs> when you what is spam, by the way? I don't I don't know how they label the can anymore. It used to be, you know, the first item on the can uh, in the ingredients is the one that's the most of it. And the first item would be pork byproduct. I thought it was ham. Boy, it be like ham. ham is is off the, the carcass of a hog. Okay. <laughs> but probably like three ingredients in it. Huh? Like, it's probably like pork byproduct, uh, salt, and uh, And lard. other spices and, and gelatin, pretty much. But what is pork byproduct? All the excess. Once you've trimmed off the good cuts, mm -hmm. you've got a carcass sitting there with all the good cuts gone, but it's still got meat on it. And you go in and you shave mm -hmm. and trim and cut, then you throw it into a blender and blend it together with some spices, then you shape it into a loaf, you put it in a can, pour in gelatin to seal it and, you know, fill it up. This yeah. is more of a northern thing, but all my family's from Pennsylvania, it's Scrabble. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's like the same Same thing. idea. Yeah, exactly. 
Uh, but I like Spam because I grew up eating it as a kid. The idea of Scrapple scares the hell out of me. What is Scrapple? It's basically he's had pork byproduct, but you know all the pieces. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Salted and put in a block and refrigerated. Yeah. Same it thing. Up. Pretty much same thing. It's good for breakfast, but it's not good for you. I suppose. All right. If the demand curve then is going to decrease, let's do that on the first graph, we get a decrease in demand. Equilibrium goes from A to B, but we have a price floor. What's going to happen? Is the price allowed to go below the floor? No. So you're stuck up at this price, reading to this supply curve. I'm sorry, demand curve. So that's going to be the quantity demanded. Read to the supply curve. That's going to be the quantity supplied. You're going to have a surplus. Everybody okay with that part? When the price tries to go below the floor, when the price goes into the basement, you got a surplus. If it helps you remember that. What's going to happen to the tax on sellers? That will reduce supply. That would reduce the supply curve or increase the cost of production. The supply curve is going to shift to the left or decrease. Equilibrium is going to go from point C to point D. Is that permitted? Yes. Yes, yes you can go above the floor. So over here, we're going to see a higher price and a smaller quantity. So here are your possible outcomes. You may have a surplus, or you may simply have a new equilibrium with a higher price and smaller quantity. So one of the options, so the answer to this question was all of the above. So three Could be, yeah. were offered. Okay, so one of them was the surplus. The market price may rise. But the other one is the market pr price may not be affected. Good. To show that, we've got to put everything on one graph. I'm going to do that just for a minute, even though it's against my religion, okay? If you had this decrease in demand, concurrently with this decrease in supply, your price goes, your equilibrium goes from here to here, and your price remains constant. That's a possibility. Yeah. Okay? That for my money, that question in particular, and then the questions about substitutes on, in production are the two most difficult questions to puzzle through. And there's no alternative but to, to take them as we've done, one step, one cautious step at a time, kind of like walking through a minefield. So would you recommend like making like the graphs for most of these, like as we do it? I've been teaching this course for 38 years. I still got to draw, draw the damn graphs. I just can't, so I can't visualize it. Okay. Yeah. Okay, good question. It's embarrassing to me, but thank you for asking. <laughs> One on the market for view quiz, uh, I thought for sure I'd get right, but then I got wrong. It was a uh, price of, if a price decrease in laptop, well, if a decrease in the price of laptops causes the demand of cell phones to increase. Hold on, let me catch up with you. <laughs> This is off of the re Markets Review Quiz. Yeah. Okay, and, and again, I remind you, the Markets Review Quiz, anything that says Review Quiz on Connect, that's my questions, and I think it's kind of the best uh, assessment of whether you're ready for the test. I'd be taking that Review Quiz many, many times, even though you're going to see many of the same questions, you'll occasionally see a different one. So the first part was something about what? If a decrease in the price of laptops. Okay, the price of laptops decreases, yeah. Which causes a dem causes the demand of cell phones to increase. Causes the demand for cell phones to increase? Mm -hmm. Really? And then it was like, are these substitutes or complements? I thought for sure substitutes, but I did too. I don't understand that. Why would cheaper laptops make people buy more cell phones? That doesn't make sense to me. That doesn't make sense to me. Huh? That doesn't make sense to me either. Good, good. It doesn't, I mean. Yeah. 
So that's that's a hokey question. I'll see if I can remember, and I'll see the video. It did say Kamala as a good answer, and I was thinking, well, the, the decrease in price of one would decrease. Well, anytime the decrease in price of one causes an increase in demand, when the arrows go opposite, they're complements by definition. But okay, but it's like not peanut, like they're not peanut butter and jelly. If I'm yeah, if I this would but this is saying oh people are going to buy more laptops. Cool. Then why are they going out buying more cell phones? I don't think they're complements. I think they're substitutes. I think somebody worded that question kind of squirrely, and Strickland should have read it a little more carefully. So compliments always both rise or always both fall? Compliments, the arrows always no. go opposite. Okay. okay. Maybe just real quick, okay? Um, under the demand, under supply. Under demand, you can have either complements or you can have substitutes, right? Substitutes would be like Fords and Chevys. You buy one or the other. When there's complements, the price of one affects the demand for the other, and the arrows go together. I'm sorry, compliments, compliments. My mistake. Price of one affects the demand for the other, peanut butter and jelly. If whatever one does, the other does the opposite. Okay? Peanut butter gets so damn expensive, I can't afford it, I don't need any jelly. Compliments, opposite. Substitutes, price of good three affects good four. That's going to be if the price goes up, then the demand for the other one is going to increase. So such as the milk and the cereal that we saw. Well, that was up here. That was compliments, milk and cereal. This would be Fords and Chevrolets. If Fords get expensive, we all go out and buy Chevrolets. So those arrows go together. And just in passing, we had substitutes over here for supply, right? We call them substitutes in production. And that was where the price of one affected the supply of the other. Remember that? Supply. Which way did the arrows go there? The price of one goes up, then the supply of the other is going to go down. Good. Arrows go opposite. If that helps you to remember it, okay? The only time the arrows move the same direction is substitutes in consumption. The only time the arrows go together is substitutes in consumption, Fords and Chevys. And you don't have complements in production. No, we don't talk about complements in production. In the intermediate course, you probably might discuss a joint production where you use a particular resource and produce two products with it. But so that production is like a keyword, like that kind When you see that production, really that's supply curve, yeah. You're over in this world. If you don't see production and just says substitutes, typically that's talking about uh, demand curves and alternative producers. What if I said this? The producers of substitutes and consumption are competitors. Is that true? Say that again. The producers of substitutes and consumption are competitors. Yes. Ford and Chevy. Right? Yeah. So when we talk about um, two different companies competing with one another, they're tell they're what that's saying in, in our terms here is oh they're selling substitute goods. They're tell selling goods that people will buy this one or that one, depending on you know the situation. Well one of the things that confused me about that was when you have substitutes in production, that when the price of one goes up, the price of the other also goes up. Eventually, yes. Once you decrease that supply curve, it's going to yield you a higher price, yeah. And what usually caused the price to change was a change in the demand for the other. If you guys are swimming around in this now, you are exactly where you need to be in this course. It means you've been working on it. I wish there were more than seven of you here, but okay. Take what I get. That's two more than we had last week. All right, what else? Can we go to Appendix C1? Say again? Appendix C1. 
can see number one. What is that? It's a price floor on good or is enclosed at the current equilibrium price. Subsequently, the price of substitute and consumption for R good S falls at the same time that a tax is imposed on sellers of R as a result. What happened to the price of S? It, it fell at the same time price that the S. tax was imposed on sellers. There's a tax on R and then good S, which was, was it a substitute or a complement? Uh, some, a substitute in consumption. Okay, which is a substitute in consumption. Now, I'll give y'all credit, you're picking some of the toughest questions in the entire appendices to work on. That's great. Okay. So we got good R, it's going to have a price floor at equilibrium. E so what's going to happen? You're going to have a change in the price of a substitute, and you're going to have a tax on the good. Have you identified those two forces that are going to be working here? Okay. If there is a change in the price of a substitute, which curve is going to be affected? The demand curve. Demand curve. So this is going to change demand, and in fact, if the price of S goes down and there are substitutes, what will happen to the demand for R? Um, decrease. It's going to decrease because it substitutes cheaper, people buy more of that, so they demand less of what you're selling. Okay? If you put a tax on R, which curve is going to be affected? Supply. The supply curve. Okay? And which way is it going to go? It's going to decrease. It's going to supply. decrease or shift to the left. So these are the two things that are going on, and those are the two different graphs we need to draw. So we'll start off our equilibrium in each case. We're going to price floor. And that's how we're going to begin. I'll show this one over here. Decrease in demand. What's going on? Surplus. You can't go below the floor. If you try to go below the floor, you get a surplus. If you want to draw the quantities, that's fine. You know, if you understand it, that's fine. Right okay with that part? If I get ahead of you, slow me down. You know, it takes time to draw this out. Let's show the decrease in supply. Supply shifts to the left, it decreases, equilibrium rises. Is that permitted? Yes. You may go above the floor, that's fine. So you could have a higher price, smaller quantity, or you could have a surplus. Those are your possible outcomes. So why would the first one be a surplus? Why wouldn't it be a shortage because the equilibrium is below the price floor? Okay. We go back and we say, well, this demand curve is gone. And this is the price because the price cannot go any lower. Okay, so, okay, so it's above. Okay. So we say, well, let's go to the demand curve and read. Oh, that's the quantity demanded at this price to the demand curve, quantity demanded. Okay. At this price to the supply curve, quantity supplied. More supplied than demanded is a surplus. Okay. Yes, I was just looking at it wrong. That's okay. That's, it helps to go through that, you know, very meticulously multiple times to try to lock it in. And that was another one of those questions where one of the options was the market price may not. The price could have remained constant if you, in fact, had a decrease in supply. Oops. Over here, I was never good with crayons. Okay. <laughs> So yeah, price could have remained constant or unchanged. So for that one, the price could have stayed constant, but the quantity demanded is less now. But the yeah. price is still the same. Well, 
Yes, you would be at this point where the quantity, the equilibrium so quantity, what would be less. I guess my question is, one of the answers could be worded like that. Price will stay constant, but quantity demand quantity, will Or decrease. just quantity, market equilibrium quantity one. would be decreased. Good, yeah. Good, you're looking for additional answers. Yeah. So, so the answer is the market may experience a surplus in it's probably That's a possibility? It's all the above, okay. Okay. because Good. it could rise to it at the same time. Okay. Good. All right, questions. I'm very pleased. Do you want to do one on the ceiling? Sure. Sure. Um, so I guess number three on Appendix C. C number three. A price ceiling on good R is imposed at the current equilibrium price. Okay. Subsequently, the price of a substitute in consumption for R good S falls at the same time that the cost of producing R falls. Is the price ceiling at equilibrium, you said? Yes. Yeah. If you can follow my notation slash chicken scratch it on the board. We've got a price ceiling on R at equilibrium. We've got a reduction on the price of a substitute in consumption. I'm currently with an in, a decrease in the cost of production. Okay, so let's set up, we, let, let's just stop for a second. Price of a substitute in consumption, which curve is affected? Price. Substitute in consumption. Demand. Demand curve. Okay. What will happen to demand? It'll, oh. It'll rise. Substituting consumption. Give me an example. Uh, Toyotas and Nissan. Yeah. Toyotas and Nissan. If Nissan, Toyotas get cheap, what's going to happen to the demand for Nissan? It's going to rise. Decrease. This is the only one where the arrows move yeah. together. Okay, Fords and Chevys. Okay. Cost of production for R decreases. Which curve is affected? Supply. Supply, Supply curve. Supply. Which way will it go? It will increase. It's cheaper to make them, so we make more of them. So let's set, let's draw this initial equilibrium with the price ceiling. And since we're moving two different curves, we'll have two different graphs. That's where we're going to start. By ceiling at equilibrium. Show a decrease in demand. Let's do that one first. If demand decreases, we're going to, indeed, goes to the left. We're going to go from point A to point B for equilibrium. Is that permitted? Yes. Yes, yes you can go below the ceiling. So you might wind up, indeed, with a lower price and a smaller quantity. That is one possibility. Let's decrease supply over here. If you decrease supply, shift it to the left, equilibrium tries to go from C to D. Is that permitted? No, thou shalt not go above the ceiling. So you're stuck at this price. This supply curve is gone. So at this price that you're stuck at, we read over and say, oh, that's the supply curve. So that's the quantity supplied. And oh, let's read to the demand curve. Therefore, that's the quantity demanded. What have we got there? We ain't got enough. People trying to buy more than we got, so we have a shortage. Everybody okay with that? If you do about 40 of these, I get to be really natural. So would it be, can you assume that when you have a price ceiling that you are going to have a shortage, and when you have a price floor that you're going to have a surplus? Let me say it very carefully. A floor will never give you a shortage. Okay. It can only give you a surplus, and only if you try to go below it. Gotcha. 
A ceiling will never give you a surplus, but it will give you a shortage if you try to go above it. So if you're standing on the roof, you got a shortage. If you're standing in the basement, you got a surplus. If it helps to remember that. So right now that we're talking about concepts, you can assume that but further on when we start going into how far supply is getting decreased, that's where that'll come into play where we'll either have or not have a shortage. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you have this decrease in supply, but at the same time you have this tremendous decrease in demand, this may be the dominant result. Gotcha. Yeah. Which really gets messy. Yeah. We try not to go through Sounds too like it already. <laughs> yeah. But we shouldn't just assume that, like, looking at the answer, so like number five, it's like a price floor is on good R. So then, I mean, will we just assume that the market expense is surplus? No, you know it's got a price floor in it. You know it might have a surplus. It damn sure ain't going to have a ceiling. But it's I mean, not a positive. A short end. But then you got to see, does it have a surplus, or does the price stay above the floor? So the answer to that one was that the market price, oh, the market price would fall. Yeah. Okay. Cost, yeah. And, and your, your halfway question there illustrates, again, one of my biggest faults when I take exams like that, they read them too quickly. You've got to go very slowly. Okay, other questions? So you would recommend like breaking each one down them. like this? Oh, no. and right. To me, this is like a murder mystery. Yeah. You know, you're looking for hints and clues, you're writing down each one to see what it leads to, and then you put the whole picture together. Th this helps a lot. Good. Just do that every single time. Absolutely. You know, it's gonna take forever, just do it every single time like that, it helps a lot. Okay. Yep. Versus trying to like, you know, read the question and do this in your head. Can't. Yeah. That's what I was trying to do, and that's where I was ending up elsewhere. That's what gives me job security. Yeah. A lot of people try to do that, and they come back and take the course again. Yeah. Um, how about, have any of you worked on the idea of the incidence of attacks mm -hmm. or consumer surplus? Yeah. Those two in particular. Let's, uh, let's do a consumer surplus first. I, I personally see that as the simplest. You're a retailer, and you suspect that the demand curve for your, let's say, one product looks something like that. And for whatever reasons, you have decided that you will charge a price of $12. If you knew this demand curve, you could figure out where its intercept is on the price axis up here. Let's call that $20, okay? So these are both going to be given to you in the question. Also given to you is at $12 price, how many are you selling? Let's say the answer is 200. This is the, the way the information is gonna be presented. Now what's really going on here? At $12, people are buying 200 of them. What if you had charged $14? There are going to be less people. There will be less, but there would still be some people willing to pay $14. There was somebody willing to pay $19.99. You see what I'm saying? When you charge, and this is the key, and this is the beauty of it because it's very practical. If you charge $12 and you're sitting there at your retail store watching your customers come in and out and buy it, you should remember that some of those customers would have given you more money if you had known how to ask for it. This is how markets and bazaars and yard sales work, right? As a seller, you come in and you say, that's too much, will you take this? And you start negotiating. As the seller, you wait for that person to come in and you try to get him as high a price as, as he'll pay. Isn't that what the used car salesperson does? Always. If someone is willing to pay more, but they buy it for less, we say they got a surplus in value. They were willing to pay 18 bucks, they only paid 12, they got a $6 surplus in consumer value, the consumer surplus. The object of the game in business is to capture as much of that consumer surplus as you can. How could you do that? Offer warranties. Offer all kind of warranties. Have every sale be a negotiated sale instead of here's the price, okay? Or next time you go into Walmart, look at their lawnmowers. 
they've got, I think it's five or six of them up there, and they go from like 138 bucks to $394. And what happens? You get a little more fancy stuff on each one, right? But the big question is, how much were you planning to spend for a lawnmower? And if you said, well, I figured the damn thing going to cost me $400, you walked in there, and what happened? This is the neat psychology. You looked at that $400 lawnmower and said, well, that's, yeah, that's about it. Whoa, there's a cheaper one. And so you trade down to one. You know, it's only $300. What's missing? You will identify what's missing. You will immediately say, if this one's cheaper, what's missing? And then it'll start worrying you. Because you were ready to spend $400. Are you willing to come out with less than you wanted, less than you could have had? And so we present four, five, six different price lines of mower so that whatever you were willing to spend, we're going to try to get you to buy it at that level. Well, so, so I have a problem with the logic of that. Okay. Because if, presumably, if you have four different lawnmowers, mm -hmm. or four different cars or something like that, and each are at a different price, and one has a basket on it and the other doesn't, well, surely what I, as the seller, have I not paid more for that? Uh, your supplies. But your markup in price more than covers oh, the basket. Okay. So your profit on the higher mower, the higher price, is still a greater profit. Okay? If I walked into a, a sporting goods store, I like to fish. If I walked into a sporting goods store and nobody knew it but I'm a millionaire, and I said, I'm going to buy this $25 spinning rod, what's a smart salesperson going to say to me? Well, this one here is better. He's going to say, well, what kind of fishing do you do? Where do you fish? Really, have you ever tried one of these? And he's going to try to trade me up into a better rod, not knowing whether I can afford it and I'm willing to pay for it. But if I say, well, yeah, it is pretty good. Yeah. He's like, well, not only that, we got a special on some tackle boxes. Let me show you that. And the next thing you know, i got some lures you, you know, might want to consider buying. And by the time I walk out of there, what have I bought? Did I buy a $25 spinning rod? Oh, hell no. Look at the boat behind my car. <laughs> and all the trap, the tackle, et cetera, et cetera. It's called suggestion selling. We never know how much someone's willing to spend. So in our society, where we tend to advertise, advertise stuff with a, a stated price, we gotta figure out some different ways to get the consumer surplus. If you've ever been abroad, in, in, in many countries, you go into their bazaars or even some of their stores, and if you see a price even marked on something and you pay that price, what, what do we call you? Sucker. Stupid, yeah, mm -hmm. sucker. Because it, there, the custom, the, uh, the uh, what's the word I want, the culture, is that you always look at something and you immediately go, you kidding me? No way, man, I'm not paying that. I'll give you this, to which you're, you're expected to do what? If you're the seller. If you're the seller, you say, I'm feeding my kids off of this. Come on, I can't mark that price down. You'd be taking money out of my kid's pocket. And so we get a good negotiation going, and we both enjoy it. And if you're from that country, Typically, that's, you, you love that stuff. If you're an American and you go into that environment, you feel very uncomfortable. Because we're not used to negotiating. Mm -hmm. And so we get screwed. <laughs> so what's going on here? The consumer surplus at issue is defined to be the area of this triangle. This is the extra money all those people would have spent if you could have figured out how to get each person to pay his maximum. Can you tell me the area of that triangle? The area of a triangle is one half the base times the height, and maybe you took newer math and have a different way of doing it, but it always worked for me. How large is the base of this triangle? 200 units. How high is the triangle? From 12 to 20. Eight. Multiplying all that out, that's an $800 consumer surplus. That's all there is to it. Okay? Now, let me ask you one more question. How much money did you make? How much money did you bring in? $2,400, right? You sold 200 units, 12 bucks a piece. Your total revenue, that would be this rectangle, total revenue is price times quantity. We're going to use that quite a bit in the future. Okay, So you made $2,400 
in total revenue. Everybody okay with that? Your consumer surplus, which you could have made if you knew how, was another $800. So the total, this is my phrase, the total value received by your customers is the sum of the two, 3,200. Okay. And when I teach retailing or when I occasionally go to work uh, consulting maybe with a retail store, I try to get this point across, particularly to people who are new starting up a store. If this is your behavior every day, there's $800 walking out of your front door every day that you didn't get that was available to you. Let's talk about how to go after that, okay? Maybe we build separate price lines. Maybe we build fancier and fancier products or warranties. Maybe you and your employees learn how to talk to somebody and do some suggestion selling and negotiate the price or the total package up. But you try and get some of that. And if you can get another $400 a day, son, that's $2,000 a week. You can afford to settle your bar bill, that kind of money, okay? So when you get, when you get these questions, what are, they, what, are they, what are you trying to solve for? The consumer service, everything, everything? You may be asked any of these. I see. So you want to be ready for those. I see. Almost certainly you'll be asked the consumer surplus, but occasionally it'll be phrased in such a way that you've got to know what this is too. Will it say though the total value received? Value it received. Will. It would say that mm -hmm. exact words. Yeah, because all these questions on consumer surplus are mine, not from the text. So we need to know how to get each thing. We yes. need to know how to get the you need to calculate that. Surplus. You need to calculate that. And remember to add them together to get the total value received. Okay. And within this course of microeconomics. I firmly believe this is one of the three most valuable things you'd ever learn, whether you're a consumer or a business person. This holds the key to creative thinking about how to go out and make more money. All right, questions? That's consumer's surplus, fairly straightforward. I'll do the incidence of attacks Maybe not completely. The incidence of attacks says, here's the normal supply curve, here's the normal demand curve, the price is $10, and at that price they sell 200 units, and it says, what happens when you put a tax on the seller? That's the only way we're going to do it, tax on the seller. If you put a tax of $1 per unit, you basically have raised the production cost for the seller so that before he will sell 200 units, he doesn't want $10, he wants $11. You see that? That vertical distance is the tax per unit. This is a point on his new supply curve. His new supply curve is $1 higher than his old supply curve. The question is, when you make him pay $1 per unit tax, how much of it does he pay and how much of it does he pass along to his consumers, his customers? Who pays the tax is the incidence of a tax. And look what happens here. What happened to the equilibrium price? It rose. It rose, but not by a full dollar amount, did it? No. It rose to $10 and 53 cents. I've been doing this a long time and I can measure that quite accurately. $10 and 53 cents. So out of that $1 per unit, how much of it is a consumer going to pay? He's paying 53 cents more than he did. So if the consumer's going to pay 53 cents, the producer's going to pay what? 47 cents. Producer or seller, whichever you want, okay? And how much total tax is going to get paid? Well, we have to see the new equilibrium quantity. Let's make that be, just for simplicity's sake, let's say that's 100. How much tax is the government going to collect? $100. Dollar per unit times 100 units, $100. Out of that $100, how much of it did the consumer or the customer pay? Customer paid, customer paid $53 of the total tax, 
seller paid $47 of the total tax, the total tax collected was $100. And pretty simple. You know, you know, got to look at it a couple times, not a bad deal. What number is that easy and simple? Yeah, yeah. Now here's where it gets a little more complicated. What if this demand curve were pretty flat? Instead of being fairly steep, what if the demand curve were really, really flat? We won't do numbers so much, okay? But look, here's the supply curve. Here's the supply curve after the tax. Right? Shifts us to the left. How big is the tax? Well, it's the vertical distance here. There's your total tax. You with that? What happened to the equilibrium price? Just about the same. It didn't go up very much. It went from price one to price two. But the total tax went up to here. So what happened? The producer has to pay all that. The producer's got to pay the bulk of the tax the buyer's going to pay just a small part of it. Why? Because his demand, this is our terminology, is very elastic. Elastic means you're real sensitive to the price. The price goes up very much, you're going to say, oh, hell with that, I don't need it that bad. Elastic demand, I don't need it that much. So when the price started going up, the consumer, look what happened to sales. The consumer reduced his purchases by a significant amount. So with an elastic tax, I'm sorry, with an elastic demand, most of the incidence falls on the, buy, on the seller and government collects little revenue. Everybody following me with that? With the logic there? You try to tax this product that people don't really need that bad. They're going to say, no, we're not going to pay the tax to heck with it. The government did this many, a few years ago, several years ago now. They decided they would put a tax on boats, big boats. And their thinking was, people who buy big boats have a lot of money. They don't care about the tax. They'll pay it. Well, what happened? So what is it about? This is boats over 16 foot long. If you got a boat over 16 foot long and you're thinking about trading it in, but now there's a tax on it, what do you think? I think I can still fish out of this boat. I don't need that new damn boat for that. And what happened? Boat sales went through the floor. People working in the boat industry lost jobs. They raised hell with the politicians who were stupid, and they repealed the tax. Look at the opposite, again, and we'll maybe conclude with this, but very quickly. What if the demand curve were really, really steep, almost vertical? Okay. And here's the first supply curve, and here's the second supply curve. So here's the tax, vertical distance. What happened to the price? Um, it's going to increase significantly. The and consumer's going to pay what? Consumer's going to pay most of it. Consumer's going to pay most of the tax, and the seller's going to pay a little of What happened to the sales of this product? It stayed just about the same. People kept buying. Even at the much higher price, they still kept buying it. They didn't cut their purchases very much. This is called an inelastic demand. And that's what would happen if we could put a tax on food. You'd have to buy it. Which that's the why, reason. Go ahead. Which is why there is not. Well, we, we think that would be unfair, but we do tax a hell out of liquor. And cigarettes. We call those sin taxes. People want them really bad, so they'll pay the extra taxes. This is the kind of stuff we should be taxing if we want to raise a lot of money for the government. Okay. Work through, you've got to be able to do the calculations for inelastic or elastic demand. You've got to understand the logic in a multiple choice question, not a calculation, just the logic of which one will have the biggest incidence on the buyer or the seller, or which one will raise the most or the least revenue. You get those concepts down, the math, you should work the problems and do the math because you'll be asked to do that, but don't forget the concept.
Now this is all stuff for, for future exams. I don't remember seeing any of this. This is on this exam. This is called Topics in Supply and Demand. And there's a separate module for that. Okay. And it's a separate uh, appendix. Okay. Not, a, not in Connect, not in the textbook. Okay. Yeah. Okay? Anything else? Ellie, you have class at 9.30? Huh? Okay. No problem. Anybody else anything? Uh, uh, there's a class coming in here at uh, 9.45. We've got a few minutes if you've got anything else you want to talk about. Can we do one, like a hypothetical one? I don't have anything pulled up. Like a hypothetical one on either substitute goods or uh, complement goods? Sure. Just another work through another one of those? Sure. So here's one. Thank okay. Pizzas and hamburgers are substitutes for consumption. Okay. Pizza and, and hamburgers are substitutes in this is 10 on appendix B. Appendix B number 10. Okay. The price of hamburgers falls. Price of hamburgers falls. At the same time, the cost of producing pizza increases. Cost of production for pizza increases? Yes. Increases. Good. It's the first thing you look for when you read the question. Substitute in consumption. Which curves are going to move? I'm looking for phrases in there, words that tell me which curve the is going to move. Okay. When I see substitutes in consumption, I know that the price of one is going to affect the demand of the other. And if there's substitutes in consumption, which way do the arrows go? Same way. Same way. In this case, the price of hamburgers is going to fall, so I know the demand for pizza is also going to decrease. Is everybody there with that? Okay. What about this uh, cost of production for pizza? It's on the supply side, so supply is going to decrease. Perfect. This is going to cause the supply of pizza to decrease. Good. Now you identify the two curves from there on, it's pretty much rote. Okay. And again, I think it's still a good idea to draw them out. Decrease in demand. Price and quantity both do decrease. Decrease in supply. Price rises. Quantity decreases. Given those results, what's your answer that you'd be looking for? Price is ambiguous, but quantity demanded won't decrease. Price is ambiguous, you get conflicting signals, but quantity is consistently going to decrease. And at this point, you're probably getting pretty close to the aha. Oh yeah, now I see this. This is no big deal. That's good. Probably also getting to point where you're kind of sick of looking at it. And it's okay too. Okay, anybody else, anything? I have one question. Mm -hmm. um, so on the second one, so the supply went up, but... That's why we don't say up or down. We say it shifted to the left, which is a decrease. Okay. Good. Right. Good. Any decrease, and I could write the word decrease, but I've just gotten in the habit. Yes, sir. Yes. Because it shifts to the left, and it increases, shift to the right. Perfect. Okay. Anything else? Oh, yeah, that's right. Um, I think it was 17. Right? What's this? Professor, could you go over Appendix A number 17? Okay. Appendix A number 17. What's it say? If income goes up, then the demand for ramen noodles and inferior good will. To the demand 
If the incomes go up, then the demand for ramen noodles, which has told us to be an inferior good, will, okay? So when I initially thought of this, okay. I, I saw inferior good, I'm like, okay, so if I have more money, I'm not going to buy ramen noodles. So the demand for ramen noodles should decrease. That's correct. That's what I thought, but that's not what was the answer. <laughs> okay, it, first off, is that answer in there? Uh, yes, it is. Okay. The and demand we, for, the de decreased demand for ramen noodles, which is what I thought was the answer. And what letter is that? That was B. So B is correct. I'm just making notes so I'll see this on the video. What answer was given? Uh, the answer for the question was D, a decrease, decrease the quantity supplied of noodles. Oh, but that's correct too. Yes, but, but B is correct too. Decrease in quantity supplied is also correct, right? Yeah. Because when you have a decrease in demand, you go down the supply curve, that's a decrease in quantity supplied. So in this question, what? Well, there's two correct answers. The, so so my, my, my question is about that is how do we know, should I be looking at it from, oh, there's a decrease in ramen noodles or a decrease in quantity supplied of ramen noodles? Yes. Like, now I have a question. The option on the, to take one. Exactly. Yeah, I was like, well, test, I'm gonna have will it be like A and B? Like that? Like D is going to be A and B are correct? I put this in there intentionally to see who was working through the questions or not. Because if you found this and you brought it to me, I know you've been working on it. Okay? On the exam, there will not be questions with two good answers. Okay. Okay, that's what if I'm by saying. any chance yes. there ever was, I would give you full credit for either answer. Okay? okay? So as you take the exam, if you find some weird questions, you want to make a note to yourself, the numbers of the questions change. Because every time you take an exam, it shuffles them, and then you take it, it shuffles them. But if you write out for what, what the question said, and you think it's got two answers, and you can make a note on that and send it to me, I'll check it out. The only thing is, Professor, they don't let you take your notes out of the big open lab. So if you if I write notes, I have to turn that in at the end of the test uh, because they don't want people to take the answers before you post. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, these questions I've been using my my questions I've been using for thirty years, and no others are from the test bank. So I'm relatively confident on them. What I do find once in a while is a student will remember enough of a question to say, "Well, I read it this way." And I, if I can find that question, I'll go back and see if that's a reasonable way to have read it. And if so, then I'll give you credit if your answer was correct according to your reasoning. So do, if you can't take notes, at least do try to remember anything that's kind of squirrely. Good. But congratulations, you found the one, at least one of them. Oh, there was yeah, a few a more that we went them. through that were like, oh, are you sure? I don't think somebody. so. There's another one on the appendix B. <laughs> Pretty sure. Yeah, there was one on the appendix B, I think. Well, if you find it, email me. I'll clarify. Okay? Thank you for your time. Thank you. I appreciate y'all being here. I do love being in the classroom. I hate online courses. So I like getting together. Take care. Bye bye.